air, water, and food. The three consumables required to sustain life as we know it. And since humans are living organisms that we do know, these requirements apply. In all three cases, the body chemically transforms or mixes the input material into a more complex output product. Oxygen into carbon dioxide, water into urine, and food into urine and solid waste, among its many other names. On an Earth-orbiting space station, where available resources are unfortunately limited due to cost, it's important to recycle all three types of consumables. With solid waste, the complexity of food makes it impossible to recover the original materials, so this is not done. Air, or specifically oxygen, is relatively easy to recycle through a two-step process. This is done. Urine, however, is a lot more complex than carbon dioxide. It's a mixture of various chemicals and can contain biological or chemical agents which are harmful when ingested. But urine also contains 95% water, and water is the most used consumable on the space mission by mass. Recovering this water makes all the difference between a temporary and a permanent habitat in space, or between a short trip to the moon and a long journey to Mars. Wherever humans go, the Earth must follow. It's in our spacesuits, spaceships, space stations, and will definitely be in our space habitats on planets, moons, and asteroids. I'm talking, of course, about the Earth's environment, not the actual planet. Earth, for the most part, is a closed system as far as matter is concerned. We're stuck with whatever we had 4.5 billion years ago. Even though millions of organisms transform these limited resources on a continuous basis, we never run out of them. This is partially due to the evolutionary development of organisms over millions of years that are able to convert complex chemical products into the original simple resources. In nature, nothing is recycled. Every organism just uses what it can. Eventually, a stable system emerges with the relatively few organisms that benefit and contribute to that system. Even if the system is not well balanced, the sheer size of the Earth makes these imbalances inconsequential for a month, a year, hundreds of years, or even thousands to millions of years. But eventually, an unbalanced environment won't be able to sustain all participating organisms. And this is the potential fate that the engineers of the International Space Station, or ISS, had to avoid at all costs when they built the biggest permanent space habitat to date. The ISS orbits the Earth at an altitude of only 408 kilometers. That's a relatively short distance from the ground. It's so close that it's technically within the Earth's atmosphere, the thermosphere region to be exact, but there's rarely any air there. Still, getting there requires a lot of energy, not only due to the height, but also the incredible speed of 7.66 kilometers per second that's required to dock with it. All this translates to a high cost per kilogram for resupply. So just like the Earth, the ISS is stuck with whatever it has after the resupply ship leaves, which could be between every 90 to 120 plus days. But unlike the Earth, the ISS doesn't have the time nor the size required to maintain a stable environment that can sustain human beings naturally. And this is where artificial means need to recycle two of the most used consumables air or oxygen, and water. Oxygen is relatively easy to recover, and a future video will be made about that process. Water, however, is not easy to recover, and that's what this video will focus on. The ISS gets about 420 liters of water every three months. The astronauts are allotted 11 liters of water a day at most. 
There are usually six astronauts aboard the ISS. It's easy to see that without a way to recycle the used water, the ISS would have to be resupplied with water every month. This would be very, very expensive at a rate of about $22,000 a liter. The ISS has two independent water recycling systems. One is in the Russian section of the ISS, and the other is in the U.S. section. We'll only be talking about the water recycling system in the U.S. section in this video because more information about it is available online. The system has two main components, the Urine Processor Assembly, or UPA, and the Water Processor Assembly, or WPA. The UPA extracts water from the urine and the WPA purifies that water along with other sources of water such as water vapor from the air. Purifying water here on Earth from rivers is difficult enough, and that's starting with a relatively clean source. In space, or more precisely a zero or microgravity environment, it's even more challenging. And finally, the fact that the recycling system needs to be both compact and robust to survive the rocket launch makes it a remarkable piece of technology. We will now take a detailed look at how the urine processor assembly and the water processor assembly work together to extract and purify water from urine for safe drinking. To purify water on Earth, the general process in the water treatment plant is to remove solid particulates, disinfect to kill bacteria, and finally remove any byproduct created by the disinfection process. The UPA and the WPA combined have the same processes, but with an additional evaporation process added to extract the water to be purified. It all starts when an astronaut needs to urinate. In the restroom is a urine receptacle which is connected to a pump that sends the urine to a storage tank. The pump also prevents urine from floating around. Since running the recycling system continuously would be very inefficient, the urine is stored in a urine storage tank until enough has been gathered from the astronauts to begin processing. Inside the urine storage tank is a bellow that keeps the urine under pressure when it's released. When enough urine has been stored in the tank, it is released to the first stage of processing, distillation via evaporation. And this happens inside the distillation assembly. On Earth, this process usually requires heat and gravity. The distillation assembly solves this problem in the following way. For gravity, a spinning drum is used to create artificial gravity. For heat, the pressure inside the drum is lowered to 1 20th of the normal air pressure. This lowered the boiling point of water to about 25 degrees Celsius, which is close to room temperature. When the urine enters the drum, it will instantly start evaporating without adding heat to raise its temperature. The water vapor is compressed and condensed by a compressor inside the drum, turning it back into liquid. It then leaves the distillation assembly and moves into the wastewater storage tank. We'll get back to this tank in a little bit. Meanwhile, as the water inside the distillation assembly evaporates, air that's trapped inside the urine also escapes due to low pressure. This released air needs to be removed from the distillation assembly to prevent the pressure inside the chamber from rising and interfering with the evaporation process. A purge pump is used to pull the air out of the distillation assembly. In addition to pulling the air from the chamber, the purge pump has a heat exchanger which uses a cold fluid to condense any water vapor that's in the stream of air. The combination of air and water is then sent to a gas separator to separate the air from the water. The separator uses a rotating disc to move the liquid to its rim while the air will move towards the center. The air is passed through an odor filter and then sent back to the cabin as recycled air. The water, like before, is also sent to the wastewater storage tank for further processing. As all this is happening, the urine left in a distillation assembly becomes more and more concentrated.
At a certain concentration level, a pump kicks in and pulls the remaining urine, which is now called brine, out of the distillation assembly. and into the Advanced Recycled Filtered Tank Assembly, or ARFTA. When enough brine has been stored inside the bellow of the ARFTA, it will then be compressed to force its content into the brine filter. There the brine will be removed by the filter. The remaining solution, which has less brine, will then be fed back into the distillation assembly for further distillation. This cycle continues until the brine concentration is just below the amount needed for precipitation to form. Precipitation anywhere in the urine processing assembly will cause it to be less efficient and even stop functioning. When the brine filter is fully saturated, it's removed along with the brine and becomes part of the waste to be shipped out of the ISS. A new filter is put into place and the recycling operation continues. The brine filter is one of the few disposables of the water recycling system. Now back to the wastewater storage tank. This tank is the first part of the water processing assembly or WPA and it's the source of the water that will be purified. What we're starting out with is dirty water. This is similar to what a water treatment plant on Earth would start with, but instead of a tank, it would be a river. Since the wastewater tank is also pulling in condensed water and water vapor from the air inside the ISS, it's going to contain a mixture of air and liquid. Air buildup inside the WPA may cause reduced efficiency or cause it to stop functioning altogether. So right after the wastewater leaves the storage tank, it's fed to a gas separator. The separated air, just like before, is fed into the cabin of the ISS as recycled air. The dirty water, however, still has many steps to go before it can be fed back into the cabin for normal use. After leaving the gas separator, the dirty water is fed into a particulate filter. This filter removes solids like dust and hair particles down to 0.5 micrometers that are suspended in the dirty water. After that, the water is forced through two multi-filtration beds. These beds contain eight layers of filter which removes various types of dissolved contaminants, including bacteria from the dirty water. The two beds are identical, so the process is repeated twice in a single pass. As the first bed becomes full of contaminant, it is removed and the second bed is put in its place. A new bed is then placed in the position of the second bed. As of 2019, it seems that NASA is only using one filtration bed. After the multi-filtration bed, the dirty water is now clean. Almost. It no longer has particulates, bacteria, or most contaminants. But, it still contains volatile organic compounds. These are organic chemicals like low molecular weight alcohol, acetic acid, among many other similar chemicals that are used in the manufacturing of everyday products. Because they evaporate easily, being volatile, they are also easily dissolved in water and are not removed by the multifiltration bed. So to remove them from the water, we have to pass them through a catalytic reactor assembly called Volatile Removal Assembly, or VRA. In order for the VRA to be effective at removing the organics from the water, the water must be heated to 267 degrees Celsius. And in order to make the process as energy efficient as possible, the temperature of the water is raised using waste heat from the moderate temperature loop or MTL of the ISS. The MTL, which is water-based, removes heat from inside the ISS. This heat is fed to an external radiator, which radiates it into space. But on its way there, it is also shared with the water processing assembly to heat up the water coming out of the multi-filtration beds. This is done through a heat exchanger.
After this, the water is passed through a regenerative heat exchanger to further raise its temperature and increase the energy efficiency. The source of the heat for this heat exchanger will be the heated water after it passes through the heater in the catalytic reactor assembly on its way to the final stage of the water processing assembly. So first, the water is heated to 267 degrees Celsius. Then it enters the catalytic reactor assembly. As it flows through, oxygen is introduced into the reactor which neutralizes the dissolved organic volatiles by oxidizing them. After the reactor, the hot water is fed through the regenerative heat exchanger. And then to the gas liquid separator to remove the oxygen that was added in the catalytic reactor assembly. The oxygen is returned to the cabin of the ISS. After that, the water is once again fed through the regenerative heat exchanger. Each time the hot water is passed through the regenerative heat exchanger, it gives off some of that heat to the incoming water. And this means that it will require less energy to raise the incoming water to 267 degrees Celsius. It also means that the hot water is getting cooler as it approaches the end of the purification line. Finally, after the warm water leaves the regenerative heat exchanger for the second time, it is sent to the final processing step in the water purification process, the ion exchange bed. It removes dissolved products created from the oxidation process inside of the catalytic reactor assembly. It then adds iodine to the water for residual microbial control. The process of turning urine into potable water is now complete. Water is sent to a pot of water tank where it is stored and distributed as needed. As complicated as this diagram looks, it's a simplistic general view of how the axle water recycling system works on the ISS. Each component has way more moving parts than shown in this animation. And this goes back to what was stated at the beginning of the video. The Earth has the ability to maintain a stable environment over thousands or even hundreds of millions of years with millions of species independently affecting it. But such stability comes at a cost of time and requires the size and mass of a planet. Something that we humans may never be able to reproduce. So, if we plan to travel the stars and roam the galaxy, the next best thing is to artificially simulate the Earth's environment as much as possible, take it with us, and hope that we've simulated enough parameters accurately that it will allow us to reproduce successfully for millions of years. I'm DexDFX for the Celestial Sphere.